Thank you, Jerry, for the uh, very kind uh, introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank God, because I don't know how this device works, and uh, so it would have been difficult. Um, as it says here, I'm an MD, and uh, I'm overstepping, because on the one hand, I'll talk about science, but uh, this is not here yet, so this is not what scientists should do, talk about dreams in the future, but you should concentrate on your experiment. And as a medical doctor, I should treat patients and not talk about dreams or what's going to happen in the, hopefully not next generation. But nonetheless, we need a plan and we will talk about this here and this, we'll come to this, is the accumulation of stem cells. And every color here is one kidney cell, but let's first start with the medical problem. That's the medical problem. That's the health problem of chronic kidney disease. Difficult to see. This is the percent of population with new cases of CKD by age group. And this is above 65, and this is below 65. And you can see above the age of 65, there is an increasing number of chronic renal disease, so it's a significant problem. It's about 4 to 7% of the population over 65, which is affected. This is the prevalence rate, and the last year is 2009, and uh, it goes up. When you look here, even more difficult to see, you see here the number of transplanted patients, in gray, and here in green, you see the patients on hemodialysis. And uh, these are large numbers. And here you can see very nicely the numbers in dollars and billions. These are the total costs. And the total costs in 2009 were $42 billion for the treatment of chronic renal disease in the US. You add Europe to that, you can see that we have a significant problem. Now, the first thing is we should think of repair. We should think of treatment. And that's what I normally do as a medical doctor. And this shows you the working groups in my department in Hanover. Here's the kidney. And there are my group is working on endothelial cells in the kidney. Another group is working on pericytes, Maria Schiffer, some of you may know, works on podocytes, tubular cells. But over the years, despite all these major research efforts from us and from others, no new medication. The last medication accepted by the FDA to treat chronic renal disease is from the 80s. So the FDA actually is under pressure because uh, where are the new medications for such a pressing problem? And treatment of hypertension, blockade of the renin angiotensin system uh, called uh, blockade, harassed blockade. This is what your doctor prescribes at the moment if you have hypertension, if you have chronic renal disease. SGL2 inhibitors. Another interesting story may be new medications, but that's only half a year old. And apart from that, we have not been successful. However, we have been successful not with repair, but with replacement. And here you see, starting in the 1850s, the principle of diffusion by Thomas Graham. 1913, an American, John Abel, the first machine which was used in animals for dialysis. And then in Germany in 1924, Georg Haas in Gießen, the first very complicated machine for treating patients. And then in the Netherlands, Johan Wilhelm Kof, this is the first dialysis machine. It took about 100 years from the scientific principle to this machine. Then it was picked up rapidly by the army. Korean War was first used in large numbers to save the lives of soldiers with acute trauma. And then out of that, we had in the 1970s, Travenol, this is the first filter made by industry, and I can still remember that. 
that we used. These were old machines when I started nephrology. And now we have very complicated membranes, and these are modern machines. And what you can see here on the right-hand side is a very nice picture where transplantation in 1953 meets dialysis. Because here, <laughs> the Herrick twins were the first transplanted in Boston, identical twins, uh, twins, no immunological problem, and they look at the machine from Johann Wilhelm Koch. But even with this traumatic improvement, and you can read this in an article, you can't see it here, this is by Fellner and Gottschalk, a very nice article where I <coughs> took this information from. When we look at the results, and this is sad, because I'm a nephrologist, and I want my patients to be healthy, to survive. And this shows you the number. These are the patient survival rates by dialysis and transplantation. So transplantation is better uh, than dialysis. But you see the five-year survival rate uh, between 30 and 40% and 80% uh, with a transplant. But when you look for the 10-year graft survival rate, we have a problem because uh, this is 40%. We have spent millions to improve this rate. I run a large program in Hanover, and we were only partially successful. So that's the basis, then, to think of, can we do better? Before we do this, we have to do a uh, few basics on the kit. Don't be afraid, this will not be physiology class. And there are some physiologists uh, in here, bear with me, I'm sorry about that. This is a very abbreviated version of what the kidney is doing. That's the list of important functions of the kidney. And you only have to look at the upper three because this is what we really want from a new kidney. We want everything, we want all these uh, functions but we want regulation of water and electrolyte. Because we have to get rid of the water, otherwise we would suffocate. We have to get rid of at least some electrolytes, like potassium, otherwise our heart would stand still. And we have to excrete this metabol metabolic waste product from the body and what we take in. It would also be nice to have regulation of acid-base balance, but before we get there, uh, we have to have a very complicated kidney. Gluconeogenesis, I think we can forget about this. The liver can do this or we eat enough. Control of arterial blood pressure, we have pills for that. <coughs> and secretion, excretion of hormones, EPO, Amgen has taken care of that. Like we can replace that. We can give vitamin D. And uh, the control of hypertension is also something we can do with step. But these three, that's what the kidney, the new artificial kidney, has. Oh. That's terrible. No, here we go. Now, what is the structure we need for that? And now it becomes even more complicated. Because here you have the kidney sitting there almost forgotten. Nephrology is a lonely subject, you know, because the kidneys don't work. Uh, nobody realizes the kidneys are out of order till it's too late normally. <laughs> so they are well protected here. You can see a lot of blood is going into the kidneys. And then we have a complicated structure, which you can see here uh, in, uh, under the microscope, that the blood vessels come in here. They form these little glomeruli where we filter a lot of fluid, 180 liters every day, which is then going through these channels here, running up and down, and the body takes care of taking back something, secreting a little bit, taking back something. So at the end of it, we have a concentrated urine and hopefully a complete homeostasis of the body. So this is what we want to achieve with the kidney. And even more so, here you have another diagram of nephron, and we have a million 
of these nephrons in each kidney. Some of them go away, they disappear. When we have chronic kidney disease, this goes down to 200,000, 150, 50,000, and then we only realize that the kidney is not functioning anymore. And this complicated structure, the nephron, we filter here, and then we have different areas where the kidney regulates what's going on. That this works now here, I mean, you're all producing urine at the moment, your tubular cells are working like crazy, they need a lot of energy here, they need a little bit less energy here in order to control all this. This is what we want to achieve. And in order to do this, we have to generate tissue. Here you see the glomerular structure, the nephron again, and here you, it gives you a glimpse of what this structure looks like inside our body. In order to make these glomeruli, in order to make the photocytes, in order to make the endothelial cells and the glomerulus and the different cell types in the nephron, we need more than 20 distinct cell types in order to make a new kidney. Now you understand why I was so, well, a bit hesitant to start with that. Because we should treat patients, we should do science, and you need a little bit to be naive. You have to be courageous and determined. And these two guys, three actually, here you see the two of them standing in the lab doing actually experiments in order to get their machine flying the right brothers. They had all this. And this is also from the article from Susan Ferner and Carl Gottschalk Hey, using this as an example of determination, do you think they would have thought that eventually it would look like this? And the problem we have really are the long lines when we wait for security at the moment, <laughs> and not these really 10,000 of devices we have in one tube. So from here to here, it took 100 years. And we are, and this is what I will talk about, we are far more advanced with a new kidney. However, another role model is, uh, and I'm hesitant as an approach to use Leonardo da Vinci, but nonetheless, it's an important role model because you have to do, at the same time, or at least when you think about these problems, on the one hand, you have to be an artist, you have to be a scientist, and you have to be an engineer. We will not have a new kidney just by playing around with cell biology. And in the end of it, we need industry for that. It's like with dialysis machine. But this will be industry where, some of you may have seen this Hollywood movie, Avatar, you know, this is what new kidneys will look like when we make them, and this will be interaction between scientists and engineers. So this is what we will talk about. We will talk about stem cells, because this is how it all starts. And we will talk on the one hand about in vivo. Do we have examples? Like, yes, we have them here at MDIVL, where we can study the development of new kidneys in living animals, and we will talk about understanding and using stem cells in vitro. And what I really want to achieve is to give you an understanding that these two areas, looking at animals on the one hand, and making use of that for the <coughs> making of new kidneys, that this has there is a relationship, and this these are the scientists working. Let's start with the in vivo, and it all started a long time ago in, at MDIVL. This is me, much younger, <laughs> not so much uh, gray hairs. Um, this is Jennifer, who is sitting here in the back, who uh, ran the lab at the time. These two, Maris Elger and Heart Potential, were the specialists for fish kidneys on the planet. They came here with Dr. Kinner, who worked here for a long time, 
from the Max Planck Institute. Marlies is still teaching anatomy in Heidelberg, and he's retired now. Ferdinand, who was with us during the summer, got into biotech business, ruined two companies, is now <laughs> trying to ruin the third one. <laughs> And this young man is uh, a cardiologist at Stanford. So uh, you can make a choice who did better of these two. And Torsten <laughs> has been a biochemist at the time, is now responsible for quality management at Hanover Medical School. And it all started <coughs> with the shark. Forrest was working with sharks. A lot of people worked with sharks. And we asked the question, together with uh, Hartmut Henschel and Marley's, these are the kidneys, you know, there are two kidneys here, you can see the rectal band of the shark. And we were interested in what the kidney looked like, and the kidney has glomeruli. There are tubules, so they don't look like ours, they are differently organized, but nonetheless, they have all the right components. And the question was, do we have development of new renal tissue in the shark? And after a basics in renal physiology, and now we have a short course on uh, <coughs> embryology and kidney development. Uh, the basic principle is that two different tissues come in contact. And one is called the ureteric bud. It goes into a more diffuse cellular mesh of metanephrogenic mesenchyme. And you can, then you can see here that the bud induces these mesenchymal cells. They develop into something like this. Then they make these long nephrons. And in the end, we have a whole tubule and a glomerulus. We still do not understand everything of that. However, this beginning is molecularly very nicely understood. A problem we are working with is how do these arterioles actually come in contact? with the plumeric. So the question was, do we see any of these structures in the fish? And even you can do this under the microscope. Here, you see the ureteric bud, and here you see the mesenchyme getting organized, as you can see here. And yes, we found all of these structures in a part of the adult shark. So the first indication, yes, there is ongoing natural genesis in the shark kidney. We started with the shark, but then we moved to skate, because the skate is much more easy to deal with, because we wanted to make an experiment. We wanted to take out one kidney, which happens in real life, and then we wanted to see, does the skate make new renal tissue? And there is only one kidney left. So Chenover did this wonderful operation. We operated here. We took out one kidney. And then we looked in this area whether we could find the induction of nodal tissue. And yes, we did. These are control animals. These are nephrectomized animals, one kidney taken out. And you can see here all these early stages. And we published this in 2003 one of the first publications on regeneration of the kidney in an animal. So this is where we are. Regeneration in the fish, yes. Can be induced to make new nephrons and real tissue, yes. And the question was, where does it come from? Do we have renal stem cells? And this has been discovered at Harvard. This was uh, eight years later. It's now 2011. And the group of Davidson, who is now back in New Zealand, they first demonstrated here, you can see nephrons. You're now experienced nephrologist. Mm -hmm. I think I need you. Can you back the order No, I'm giving you back. Or a long stick. <laughs> Here you can see new tubules in a zebra fish. They are uh, destroyed here, and then they come back. And what they actually did in this experiment, they took the stem cells out, got rid of the original kidneys, and could transplant 
and may give you kidney by transplantation of a stem cell. This was a very nice uh, nature paper. You can see here, <coughs> these are the stem cells they characterize. And even more interesting, they could do this over generations. So these stem cells were viable. You could take them into new fish, and you could at least do four generations. And in green, you see these stem cells. And you can very nicely see that these stem cells were able in an already existing duct to make an addition. So this is different from ours, where we have one glomerulus and a tubule running up and down, and then we have collecting duct. This is where we have the addition to the collecting duct from these stem cells. Did we see stem cells in the shard? Yes, we did. We we're looking for stem cells in this area. We did electron microscopy and we could identify a cell type. In this area here, here you can see the urethraic butt. Here you see this mesenchyme, which is starting to make a new nephron. And in this area, we identified the cell type, which looked like this. So these are what we saw were stem cells in the kidney. You see that they are very nicely protective because they are dangerous cells. They can make a new kidney, but you don't want to make them other tissues. So you want to make them, uh, have them in a very regulated fashion, so they are wrapped up here. And uh, one of the new members of the faculty here, Dr. Losig, works on stem cells and stem cell niches. And these niches are complicated, as you can see here, and I don't go into that. And the question is, <coughs> can we characterize these niches better in the fish? And then perhaps we can go into the kidneys of humans and characterize the stem cells there. Because we have stem cells, but we lose the ability to induce them after birth. Two, three days after babies are born, they are not making new nephrons anymore. And the question is why? Are they blocked? At the moment, we don't know where they are. So the treasure hunt for stem cells, for niches and matching keys, how to open it, that's still on. And we're still looking. Now let's move from the fish and from animals. Unfortunately, I don't have to say about anything about mice. You know, we work with mice a lot, but I, mice are not as interesting as fish. They don't make new tissue, but uh, uh, they are also not really humans. So for regeneration, mice are not <laughs> very good. But we move now to stem cells and in vitro. Because <coughs> I still believe that we may be able to find stem cells in human tissue, but for the time being, I think it's um, more fascinating to work with stem cells. Now, stem cells come in two different flavors. One, you read about in the newspapers, are embryonic stem cells. We are all afraid of them because they come from the germ line. You have to get them out either by nuclear transfer or by in vitro fertilization, and there are a lot of more problems. But the second source is more, at least from a <coughs> moralistic point of view, it's embryo-independent, uh, embryo and you get these stem cells by nuclear reprogramming. Nuclear repro uh, reprogramming means you take a cell from the skin, your skin, and you reprogram it to become a stem cell. Now, this is a very nice example, thank you very much, of wonderful science. Because I've talked a lot about how complicated things are, but in this case, with a lot of ingenuity and uh, wonderful science, this doctor here, Dr. Yamanaka, he found that only four factors are necessary and I take one cell from your skin and add these four factors, I can make a stem cell 
And I could generate out of this stem cell, theoretically, a whole organ. That was astonishing. It took him six years to get the Nobel Prize for this. The first publication was in 2006, and together with this gentleman from Cambridge, he uh, got the Nobel Prize six years later. That's uh, fast. And uh, what they could demonstrate is now, in principle, that you can make human iPS cells by adding these factors, then you could grow them, you could make renal progenitor cells, you could make all these cells, and then you could use it to understand embryology, replacement therapy, drug discovery, you can disease, do disease modeling, and that's what this lab has started. In John Forrest's group, somebody <coughs> takes these cells from patients with lung disease and cultivates them and make organoids, and then one can test for an individual patient which drug works on these cells. And a researcher from Australia, Melissa Little, she has taken this, what I just hypothesized, and has done it. She published this paper two years ago. This is the protocol they use. They took these stem cells, human stem cells. They induced them, they built an organoid, and then they pulsed it with different substances. Not that many, really. And they were able to form uh, this organoid, and when they cut it here, they saw different structures, and you can see this looks like kidney. And when they th then labeled all these cells, they came up with this result. This is an organoid with 24 different cell types. And every cell type which we have in the kidney has been differentiated within this embryo body. You can see here structures. These different colors are all markers or genes which are expressed by the different cell types. And this is why it's so colorful. In fact, in the same manuscript, they described the whole nephron from the vasculature here to the podocytes, the tubular cells, collecting duct. And you can see here the examples. It looks like a kidney inside. So this was a fascinating nature paper and led to a lot of speculation. Now the crucial factor is, first, one has to characterize these cells, whether they are functioning. So far, we have only gene expression. I'll show you one example, which we did a couple of years ago, when we also differentiated by vascular smooth muscle cells, because I'm very much interested in blood vessels. And these are the cells which were characterized we could demonstrate using PCR methods that um, we had the right cells. It took us a year to generate this protocol. And then we could also demonstrate that these cells functionally had calcium signaling. And we patched them. We did electrophysiology in these cells. And we could demonstrate, yes, we have <coughs> vascular smooth muscle cells which have calcium channels. We can treat them with calcium antagonists, calcium channel blockers. So this characterization has now to be done in a very diligent way for these cells in the kidney. And the next challenge is here. Now it becomes more engineered. Now we need a three-dimensional structure. After all, we want to have a kidney where blood goes in and urine comes out, filtered, secreted, <laughs> taken back, the whole regulatory thing I've been talking about before. And there are two ways to do it. One is you use the scaffold we have been provided with, and this is the kidney which is already there, or we make a new one, and I will talk about those a little bit. Decellularization of kidneys. You can't imagine this, but we are throwing away kidneys. We are throwing away human kidneys. In transplantation, 
the kidneys come in, they are too old, it's taking too long to transport them, the patient is not here, the kidneys are thrown up. We can use these kidneys, we can decerebrize them, we perfuse them with solutions to get rid of all the cells, and then they look like this, this is the surface. There are different protocols we can use. We do this together with colleagues in Leiden, who were here at the lab last year. And then we recellularize these kidneys. Now that's much harder than to decellularize, as always, you know, cutting trees is easier than making <coughs> new ones. But nonetheless, it's an approach which is used. However, there is one problem with it, because we have still immunological problems. The matrix which we have has still properties of the original donor. And therefore, if we can use this, we still have to use immunosuppression. And I don't think this will be then that much different from transplantation. So also, I like this. I do not think that it will work on a large scale in the future. So what about other technologies? And here, we need laser technology, or we are using laser technology in cell printing. And uh, we are working with devices like this. This looks like a small kidney. We have one vessel going in. We have one vessel coming out. And in between, we have inducible stem cells. So the idea we have is a very naive one. When we make this to work, that something is flowing through, and we add the growth factors and differentiation factors, that we can actually make new tissue. And together with the function, some of these cells will do a little bit of the job, and then others. And we have seen this before happening in uh, organoids. Other cells will say, well, we could do the same. And then they get organized, and this is what we're working on at the moment. We have to have a gradient of uh, oxygen, we have to have gradients of growth factors, and we have to have crystalloids in here, which are generated so that they allow the cells to grow, they provide a basis, and once the cell makes their own matrix, this has to fall apart and give way to uh, uh, new kidney tissue. This is what it looks like. These are iPS cells on the surface of these surfaces made by laser technology. So basically, it could work like this. We take primary fibroblasts from patients, we use these four factors, we can correct mutations in tissue when we want it, and then we have directed differentiation, and we can make new kidneys out of that. How complicated it will be, I'll demonstrate within the last couple of minutes. By focusing on one specific problem, when you go a little bit deeper, because this sounds almost like you could do it at home, in your own garden. <laughs> and this has to do with functional differentiation. You know, organs are complicated. And the question is, uh, we do not need something made of Lego. We need something made of cells, and the surface of these cells has to be quite shiny. <laughs> so before you actually use it, you want a shiny surface. So we are interested in surfaces. And we are interested in the surface where the blood meets the renal tissue because that's an interface which is very important. And this is what it looks like. These are endothelial cells. This is endothelial cell surface, which looks complicated, but it's not true. This is an artifact. This is an electron micrograph, and the tissue has been treated. If you are more careful, it looks like this. This is the surface of the endothelium, of the blood vessel. And this is a structure called glycocalin. Now, this is something Jane Disney knows a lot about. Now, it definitely looks like sequence. <laughs> and it's not that far away from seagrass. 
Because as you all know, when there is seagrass, the ocean is healthy. And when we lose these things, and the glycocalyx has a lot of function. It's a habitat for inflammatory molecules and anti-inflammatory molecules. It prevents and regulates coagulation. It regulates permeability, both physical, chemical, and by allowing substances to go through. And it's important for communication. It covers receptors and it harbors regulatory molecules such as the complement system. So it really is like this. And this is what we have in our body. And if we want to make a new kidney, then we better have an intact glycocalyx. Because if we don't, and here you see this, this is Frenchman's way where Chen Disney has not been working on it. <laughs> if we don't have this uh, surface, then we have inflammation within blood vessels. This is microinflammation or full-blown inflammation. We have unmasked adhesion molecules. We have thrombus formation, edema, impaired vasoregulation. For the doctors in here, one classical example where the glycocalyx is shed within hours is sepsis. In patients with sepsis, the glycocalyx is gone. And all the doctors in here know you have to give fluids like crazy, liters, because it all seeps through the vessel wall. And we want to understand how glycocalyx is regulated, and now this opens a whole new world. Because this shows you the surface, and these are proteins, and these proteins are covered like Christmas tree with sugar. So, Glycocalyx has a protein core, it's like a Christmas tree, but it's covered individually with all the things you put on Christmas trees for Christmas. And these are sugars, and the sugars are very specific. It's not like a donut, it's really binding specifically. So all these sugars are added here, and you can bear with me. <laughs> it was difficult enough in class to learn about uh, genes and protein synthesis, and now we have to deal with all the sugar synthesis which is going on in the cell. But that's what we need to understand. We work on several of these enzymes. We have found a new one, heparinase 2, which actually, when we express it, preserves the glycocalyx very nicely. So I think we can use that. And here we know is use another apparatus which we will install here in the lab uh, in the next year where we also use uh, laser technology and we can grow these small vessels in here and together with renal cells and here you can see under the confocal microscope in green is the surface and in red this is the glycocalyx. So we can study this, how this is regulated and we also do this in the zebrafish here in the lab, these are data from the lab here, and here you can see without this heparinase, when we lose it, the endothelial cells are swollen and we want to have them flat. So this is where the circle comes round, and uh, we can use them in with these methods, stem cells and the animals at the same time, to understand how a new kidney functions. I tried to explain to you, and you understand now that this is an organoid or an embryo body, and you can differentiate all the renal cells from it. You have an understanding of a nephron and glomeruli, and you can see how difficult it will be to make this. If printing laser technology has its value, it could be to generate a form like this, and then we can grow cells in there, that's a big challenge, but I think that's doable. In order to achieve this, you need a group. I mean, you need lots of people. It's really like a big ship. I could have used the Apollo program, but here uh, on the Atlantic, uh, it's better to talk about it. The engineers here, you can't even recognize them, they have to, in one way or the other, communicate with the others. Otherwise, it doesn't work. 
otherwise we'll have disaster. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the picture of this vessel which ran aground because the crew was drunk. Which I wanted to do. And this is the group. This is Hanover in Maine. You can differentiate. This is our research group. There's Mario, there's Jennifer, <laughs> there is Lynn, who has been together with Ped running the lab. And here you can see, even under darker conditions, <laughs> they do a terrific job. And you need collaboration. The collaborators on the island, the collaborators, especially here at MDIVL, over the years, we have been collaborating with scientists interested in blood-brain barrier. You can easily see where our relationship is blood-brain barrier and surfaces and with other scientists being interested in tubular research. But we also need the collaboration with the chats and lab. I've just shown you this one example of these enzyme regulating sugar. I talked to Ron Corsangel last week. He runs the aging program for kidneys in mice on the other side of the island. And he goes to his computer and he says, well, we have four mouse strains with a high expression of sulfatase. And we have two strains with low expression of sulfatase. And I said, well, that's great. I don't need knockouts, but I need the variability of uh, these molecules. Let's see what happens when we analyze these mice. We had started a collaboration. Uh, here you see Mario and uh, Jennifer together with Portland. At the moment, this is more quiet, and I think we have to work on that. And then we have to have international people. The people who do the research on regeneration, they have to come here. So we organized these meetings. This, uh, our first one was in 2014. It's called Getting Across. It's more getting across the vessel wall, but you can use getting across for almost every purpose um, <laughs> to overcome obstacles, etc. And I think this is what we need, the collaboration and uh, these international efforts to get us to a new kidney. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm good to you. together with the sugars, it's all synthesized in the Golgi. So when a patient succeeds and survives this initial stage, the glycocalyx comes back. It takes a long time before everything is back in place. 48 hours, you have the basic functions back, but then for recovery, it needs a couple of weeks. And you can still see alterations. You can still the microinflammation we are not that good in detecting this. We are releasing our patients from ICU far too early. So they need rehabilitation for their blood vessels and the organs. So you can regenerate? Yes. This is Dr. Tarbell in New York City has done this very nicely under in vitro conditions. Thank you. Yes, please. I have a friend at Jack's that was looking at bears because Apparently, when they hi uh, hibernate, their kidneys shut off, and then they come back during the summer. Yeah, wonderful project. You know, one of the I, I, I don't know a lot about bears, but I know about this project. And what they did is uh, because bears, you know, when they sleep during the winter, their kidneys basically they fall apart. So what they did is they went into these caves. I don't know how they did it actually, and they punctured the kidneys. <laughs> these bears, they have actually, you won't believe it, they have uh, 18 or 20 biopsies from bears. Uh, and then uh, they could see that the kidneys were really partially destroyed. And then they biopsied the same bears in May, and the kidneys were back and they were normal. So the regeneration in these animals may help us as well. It's the project, I have not seen the publication, but I've heard we talked about this project because it's a fascinating project. Yes, please. 
You talked about laser centering and making a matrix to put your cells in. Um, and I think I saw polylactic glycolic acid. Yeah. Um, have you tried other materials besides those? Because when they break down, they are inflammatory. Um, I have to admit, I'm not the specialist here. I collaborate with these people, and they make suggestions. I tell them what I need, and they come up with ideas. Uh, mostly, I uh, do not understand the names of the uh, matrices they talk about, uh, uh, but it's the interaction we need for them. I can tell them, we had a, a famous matrix researcher here, Billy Hudson, a couple of years ago, and uh, the matrix researchers understand a lot what the matrix should look like, and then we talk to the engineers or to the people doing surfaces, and then they can help us with that. It's also the treatment of the surface. Now, how you make cells not only adhere, but they respond to the irregularities and they behave differently depending on the surface. So, yes, we are using different uh, substances, but I can't tell you which. Yeah. In the work on the state, if you infectomize the animal and the remaining kidney is physiologically capable of supporting the animal, what is the origin of the signal that stimulates the new adrenal growth? Now, uh, I should have been, I should have put question marks uh, where we have uh, several suggestions for that. I don't know whether it's hypoxia. Mm -hmm. Could be. I don't know whether it's the release of factors would be very interesting, uh, whether which factors are really capable of unlocking the stem cell business in the other kidney, we don't know. I have to admit, perhaps generally we are too easy on the scales. At the time when we did these studies, uh, the genome of the scale was not blown. Uh, antibodies were difficult to get, and it was just altogether too difficult a project to make career for young scientists. Uh, but it's still there waiting. Yes? There's been a lot of research on livers, too, regenerating themselves. Is there any kind of collaboration with liver researchers, or, or is it completely different, similar? That's a very good question. I mean, the question was, uh, is there interaction between these different fields of regeneration? Because uh, the cartilage is regeneration, liver, uh, heart. Uh, <coughs> the difficulty is that we are so focused that you have really to work on platforms so that regenerating people interact. At the moment, we are so focused on our individual approaches even here at the lab, we have somebody doing stem cell niches, as we do kidney, we have heart, and we have neural regeneration. And even with that, it's difficult to bring everybody together. You have to organize this in a way so that people have a basis to talk to each other. One idea could be our meetings, but even then, you know, so that they do not speak to their peers all the time. You have to mix people, and you have to ask the right questions, you have to fund these things. So at the moment, there is not enough going on. The superfish people sometimes talk to the people doing the in vitro uh, experiments, but not that much. I speak from experience. We have a large program in Germany, 50 million euros for regeneration at our medical school, funded by the government. And even there, it's really difficult to bring people together. I think this is why I showed this crew thing. You have to bring people together in order to make this work. Uh, Herman, as you know, the shark starts out uh, microscopic or small and grows uh, longitudinally. And the kidney It's not being shaped. Uh, it's not a uh, a uh, really is kidney. When you uh, think about uh, into the future, will the kidney that's generated be watching? 
Yeah. As always, you know, the most difficult questions right away. I mean, that's a, a, a major problem. Um, you may have not looked carefully. I was a little bit vague on that. I said, well, the shark kidney is almost like our kidney because there are glomeruli and tubuli, but they are organized in a different fashion. And you just mentioned it's longitudinal. So one of the big problems is really that our kidney is really compact. We have the glomeruli on the outside, and then all the tubules go inside, they come back, and then the collecting duct goes into the pelvis of the kidney, and everything is pouring into the uh, pelvis. So the big question is, will we be able to organize this? I believe if we find stem cells in the human kidney, they will sit not in the cortex, but in the medulla, where it's dark and there is not a lot of oxygen. They will be protected down there. And when we can start them to grow, I think they will grow to the light of the cortex and then find their connection in the uh, <coughs> middle. So you have seen this perhaps on this, uh, in this organoid that looks a little bit like flowers. So I think it will grow in two directions and hopefully it will integrate. And I still think there is place in the stroma. There is enough space to grow for new nephrons. But this is one important engineering question. And the uh, problem is also understanding this three-dimensionally. Uh, Marnie's elder was able to understand the three dimensions of the fish kidney. And I can tell you, the shark may be complicated, but there are fish out there. They have kidneys, they look like from another dimension. I mean, they are very differently organized. And in order to understand the spatial organization, you, you need help. Yes? Well, first, I'd like to compliment you on a beautiful film. And uh, you're a metamorphosis yourself, going through the various types of experiments. I thought it was amazing that you could do that in one lifetime, uh, or have the people that help you do it. So when you sit down, for example, and you're writing a long, heavy grant application, what is the best you could look at before you really have a kidney? Well, at the moment, I, I, sh I showed you that. We do the fish. What I didn't show you is that we have now fish where the different cell types glow in various colors. So we can actually look now at the living fish under the confocal microscope, and that's one uh, area of research we're doing. Otherwise, for writing grant applications, we use these new devices, these laser-based devices, to study in a three-dimensional way the interaction of cells and then we use molecular methods to analyze that. That's what we're doing at the moment. However, secretly, I'm writing a grant for senior citizens. There is a very nice grant uh, application you can do in Germany when you are more advanced and they believe that you have done something with your life. And they don't need a lot of data for that. They just want ideas. So <laughs> this is what I'm training on to write. Yes, please. This is, uh, perhaps if I was not that clear, at the moment prevention is uh, what we have to do. And this is what we can do as doctors. We treat blood, high blood pressure in order to prevent uh, chronic renal disease because high blood pressure damages the kidney. We treat diabetes. We try to reduce blood sugar. We try to reduce some systems like the renin angiotensin system. We do very interesting research at the moment with uh, SGL2 inhibitors because they seem to protect the kidney as well and 
There are interesting mechanisms within the kidney which we uh, look at, but mostly it's prevention. The specific treatment for diseases, we can treat inflammatory disease very nicely and hope that the damage to the kidney is not uh, that far advanced. But once the kidney is seriously damaged, we are just taking good care of the organ, but there is no specific treatment we can do. So I, I had, since you, you had mentioned that um, kidney disease is, is not detectable usually until it's very late, are there things you've learned from studying kidneys so closely, steps that before hypertension shows up, before diabetes show up, whether there are other sort of preventive? Yes. We have, um, Jennifer and I, we have been to the Seacoast Mission when six years ago, and we told them that we should do a research project on the outer island uh, to look for proteins in the urine. That's the first thing you pick up. So normally you have no proteins in the urine, and you can do this, and we have started to do proteomics in Hanover. There's a company there, or I have started a company, and they are now independent, and they use proteomics, so they, have, so they look for um, different uh, proteomic patterns in the urine. And yes, you can do that. Uh, it's still not in its infancy. There are groups uh, doing this here in the US very successfully. So screening for that, and then once you have found these patients, that's what we do at the moment. Yes, human does. I don't think it will work uh, because the you can make it smaller. Um, the it would be nice to carry it around all the time, but uh, uh, there are technical limitations to that at the moment. Still, with the dialysis membranes, you need a certain space so it won't become that small. You see in a kidney, a million of these dialysis in there, and they are very tightly regulated. So. I think we should really use technology to make this one giant leap into artificial tissue. It's hard. I mean, uh, there are, there's industry out there, and they have tried to add cells to normal dialysis, and this didn't work. You have to. It's a, it's a quantum leap. Uh, but I don't think the technology will sleep there. And uh, dialysis is life-saving. I have run large dialysis units, and. We make improvements and we work on that. We do a lot of peritoneal dialysis. And we also try to protect the peritoneum for long-term peritoneal dialysis. But altogether, our success over the last couple of years, and when I think of industry, there is not really happening that much. I mean, this is a nicely oiled machine going on at the moment. So we spend a lot of money on that, and this is all going don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing this. I just don't see the appropriate thing. I was thinking when you were talking about the bears kidney falling apart and how eels can go from fresh water to salt water, there's got to be some mechanism in that bear that makes them develop yes. another kidney. Yes. Is that guided by genes? <sighs> Most likely. <laughs> Uh, the question is which genes and uh, which part, uh, you know, with this bear project, the first question is what do you need to be in place still to make a new kidney? There has to be some matrix structure left. Which cells do you need? Does it come from the existing cells uh, which we have in the tubuli and they just regrow? Or do we need actually stem cells in there? Uh, the stem cell business in the kidney, I, I was alluding to that, is difficult. One of my uh, senior doctors in Hanover, he spent five, four years with Lloyd Cantley at Yale, and he almost ruined his career in trying to find stem cells in the, the mouse kidney, and he couldn't. So it's not easy to find this out, but yes, a bear project, but here we need more resources. I mean, it's a very nice project, but it's relatively isolated. It's a great idea, uh, but I don't see the funding and I don't see the international collaborations at the moment. Perhaps I'm wrong, but... Uh... Yes, please. Uh, I'm a 
Yes. I was wondering um, what we know about the kidney size from infancy to adult human. Is there any growth number of nephrons or I don't, I don't know the difference between the size of a baby kidney and the adult Yeah, kidney. it grows in size. That's the understanding at the moment. It's hypertrophy, becomes bigger, so in babies it's smaller. Whether there is still a repair mechanism or regeneration possible in young kidneys, we don't know. It would be great to, as a transplant doctor, I know that the younger the kidneys we transplant, the better for the patient. Not only because it has not been used for so many years, but we think there is still some reproductive uh, uh, possibility in that kidney. Uh, so yes, it grows, but so far it's only hypertrophy. And uh, we do not think that new nephrons are made. But that's what we want to achieve. Yes, please. Uh, as a transplant person, it seems to me that you may see something like they see in the liver where the stem cells of the host actually occupy the liver to an extent after transplant? Have you seen anything like that? Yes, I mean, we see chimerism. This means that the kidney goes in and then cells in, invade. Uh, I'm very much interested in monocytes uh, and invasion of monocytes in these kidneys and whether uh, how the resident monocytes, which are uh, from uh, embryonic origin, talk to monocytes which invade the kidney, uh, but this is ongoing research at the moment. I'm also interested in whether endothelial cells can be replaced by the host, uh, by the host, because that would be very nice, because then you have a lining of endothelial cells from the host, uh, but so far we do not understand that really. 